Good morning. Good morning, and welcome to Lafayette Presbyterian Church on this, the Lord's Day, and the first Sunday of the Lenten season. We are indeed glad that you are here. Uh, a few announcements before we look at our prayer concerns. First, I got a very nice note in my box when I arrived this morning from uh, the Chorus Angelorum, thanking us for hosting them. They, too, found you to be a warm and caring community. They love being with you our fellowship time, and of course, the love of the acoustics of this building. And so it was a very, very heartfelt, nice note from them. And I'll, I'll leave it out front for us to look at and for you to see. But, but it was a great event. And again, thanks to all those who were involved. Also, we received uh, from the uh, Lafayette football team, which we helped do a meal for and support, a really nice plaque. Uh, I will put somebody else in charge of hanging it because you're going to hear about my hanging woes in houses even during the sermon today, but a very nice plaque that uh, Brent got to us, and uh, uh, we are glad to support them and those young people and their hard work and all that they do in the, the schools. Uh, I do need to share that a congregational meeting will be held after worship next Sunday. It should not be a long meeting, but all are invited uh, and welcome to attend. I have learned that if I do meetings after church, but before lunch, they condense really, really quick. Uh, this is a, a new skill that I have learned, so I, I don't think we will be, be too terribly long, but again, all are invited to attend. Are there other announcements or prayer concerns this day from the congregation? Well, if you have not seen the picture of Brittany, I will share it with you after church. She is not here. Prayers for her. She is learning to find out what the cold of Boston, Massachusetts is like. And what I do know is that she will not be moving to Boston, Massachusetts anytime soon. Uh, she is trying to plan a trip to the Caribbean or just to sit on the equator for a few hours uh, after she returns. So, uh, traveling mercies to her and the group of 29 young people she has taken with her to a, a debate competition up there in the very, very cold weather where there is snow on the ground and there, us southern people aren't sure what quite to do with it. Uh, so uh, uh, prayers for that. Hearing no others, let us now turn our hearts and minds to worshiping God in spirit and truth through the special music of our friend Vince Stalling. In the morning when I rise in the morning 
When I rise in the morning, when I rise, give me Jesus. Give me Jesus. Give me Jesus. You may have. All this world, give me Jesus. Dark midnight was my cry. Dark midnight was my cry. Dark midnight was my cry. Give me Jesus. Give me Jesus, give me Jesus. You may have all this world, give me Jesus. And when I come to die, Oh, when I come to die, oh, when I come to die, give me Jesus, give me Jesus, give me Jesus, you can have all this world you can have all this world you can have all this world give me Jesus Please join me in the bold print of our call to worship. O oh God, in you we trust. Lead us in your truth and teach us. For you are the God of our salvation. For you we wait. For you we worship. Please stand as you are able and join in singing hymn number 469, Morning Has Broken. Thank mm -hmm. you.
We pause here to examine our lives, our temptations, and the ways we've fallen short before our God. Let us confess our sins together. Please join in our prayer of confession. Gracious God, as we begin this Lenten wilderness journey with Jesus, we confess our neglect of you and our faith. We make idols of nation, money, and power. We build walls instead of better relationships. We fail to follow Jesus to the poor, the destitute, the stranger. Empty us this Lent, holy God. Guide us in our faith so that we can leave this wilderness season in right relationship with you. Amen. words of forgiveness. Remember and receive, oh, please join me, I'm sorry. <laughs> please join me in our word of forgiveness. Remember and receive these hopeful words from John 8, 31, 32. If you continue in my word, you are truly my disciples, and you will know the truth, and the truth will make you free. Receive God's truth. Receive God's grace. Accept the freedom God provides. Amen. be with you. And also with you. Let us pass the peace. Our prayer of illumination. God of grace, help us seek you and the truth you intend for us today. Let us not be distracted by worldly pursuits or pleasures. Help us to focus our hearts and minds on you and your word read and proclaimed. Amen. And our scripture tonight today is from 1 Peter 3, 3 13 through 15. Here is the reading, the word of our Lord. Therefore, prepare your minds for action. Discipline yourselves, set all your hope on the grace that Jesus Christ will bring you when he's revealed. Obedient children, do not be conformed to the desires that you formerly had in ignorance. Instead, as he who called you is holy, be holy yourselves in all of your conduct. For it is written, you shall be holy, for I am holy. If you invoke as Father the one who judges all people impartially according to their deeds, live in reverent fear during the time of your exile. You know that you were ransomed from the futile ways inherited from your ancestors, not with perishable things like silver or gold, but with the precious blood of Christ, like that of a lamb without defect or blemish. He has destined before the foundation of the world, 
but was revealed at the end of the ages for your sake. Through him you have come to trust in God, who raised him from the dead and gave him glory, so that your faith and hope are set on God. Now that you have purified your souls by obedience to truth, so that you have genuine mutual love, love one another deeply from the heart. Our second reading is from Genesis. Genesis 9, verses 8 through 15. Then God said to Noah and to his sons with him, As for me, I am establishing my covenant with you and your descendants after you, and with every living creature that is with you the birds, the domestic animals, and every animal of the earth with you, as many as come out of the ark. I established my covenant with you that never again shall all flesh be cut off by the waters of a flood, and never again shall there be a flood to destroy the earth. God said, this is the sign of the covenant that I made between me and you and every living creature that is with you for all the future generations. I have set my bow and bow in the clouds, and it shall be a sign of the covenant between me and the earth. When I bring clouds over the earth and the bow, bow, is, bow is seen in the clouds, I will remember my covenant that is between me and you and every living creature of all flesh and the waters shall never again become a flood to destroy all flesh. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Good and gracious God, I pray now that the words of my mouth, the meditations of our hearts together in this place, that they might be acceptable in your sight, you, O oh God, who are our strength, our rock, our redeemer. In Christ, amen. So I, I did a little math this week, and according to my best guesstimate, that, that's a southern term, guesstimate, I have preached at least 250 sermons from this pulpit. Many of you have heard most of them and still, for whatever reason, return week after week, which speaks to the power of the Holy Spirit and your capacity to extend grace even to bumbling preachers. What surprised me, though, is that this is the first time I have preached on Noah and the ark. I've done Jacob. I've done messages from from prophets. I've even done some of the Psalms and some of the, the hard language in some of those Psalms. I've done the Gospels, of course, and and Revelation. I've even done a a first-person sermon, but not Noah. Now, while that may not surprise you, it did me, because the story of Noah and the ark has a special place in my own personal family. I was especially reminded, and, and, and I will admit, a bit reminiscent of that story when I looked at my upcoming calendar this week. You see, on the 20th of February, 26 years ago, that's hard to believe, Laura and I became parents. For the first time, a baby was born, it was placed in our arms, and we looked at each other and thought, oh my goodness, what do we do now? 
now of the many, many things I did know, not know about parenthood. Well, among them was all the things that you had to do to become a parent. I didn't think there was all that much involved. And I will be honest, I was clueless about the work that I was going to have to do when we decided to have a baby. I mean, the work before the baby ever got there. See, there was this crib. This crib had 4,800 pieces. It needed to be put together. And we had to get a changing table that had to be put together. And there were car seats that I had to try to figure out how to put in the car securely. I gave up on that finally. I heard the fire station would help you put that in. I went right on up there and said, help. I had to start baby-proofing things. Now, that baby wasn't going to be able to walk, but I heard they were going to eventually. We had to baby-put things, put stuff in outlet covers, all kinds of stuff. Had to go get a diaper genie. I didn't know what a diaper genie was, but I'm thankful for it now. And all of it, all of it had to be themed. Themed. Everything. Oh, maybe once upon a time you could have just had a baby, but not anymore. Oh, you have to have a theme for the baby in the nursery. And as you, I am sure, can imagine, the father has little to no say in what that theme is going to be. We just agree a lot. Of course, in my case, I didn't need to worry about it as my wife picked out the perfect theme. Just ask her. As for us, it was Noah's Ark. We had a Noah Ark lamp and lamp shades. There were Noah's Ark sheets and, and, and comforters. There was artwork. And, and the mobile thing that hangs over the crib that the baby wakes up and looks at, that would scare me to death now. You hang something over my bed that I have to scare up and it's coming down at me. Ooh, that would be bad. But babies, it's wonderful. They had pairs of animals over it they could look at when they woke up. We even had Noah-themed border around the top of the bedroom. You know, the top, right around the top near the ceiling, there were rainbows and animals and the ark and such. And as I tried to install that, I became Catholic and went to a priest to confess my sins of all the language that I said as I attempted to put that border up. Oh, the cute border was supposed to line up with pairs of animals going all the way around. We ended up with something quite different than what was on the package. There were three elephants together, two and one-half zebras, just one giraffe. I don't know how we still have giraffes with only one getting on it, and only the backside of the dove of peace it was confusing to look at, and yet no one except for me, oh, and Laura, looked at it all that much because when they went in to, to get that sweet baby or rock her to sleep, they, they didn't bother to look up, thanks be to God. I will note that between Brittany and Sydney, Using the nursery, a tree by a, a gentleman who was doing some work fell on our house. It was an accident. It caused us to have to do some nursery repairs, including some painting and reinstalling of the border. We got a professional to do it that time. It looked so much better for Sydney. Because if we didn't get somebody else to do it well, I might not be on this planet any longer. Of course, all of this said, in numerous areas, including one that was over the crib, as I remember it, and if it wasn't there, it, it should have been, but in my mind, it was there. You know how that works, right? 
in your mind, sometimes things appear. Well, there was a rainbow. There were rainbows of all sizes, along with the branch carrying dove. There, there were actually a couple of full doves, not just the back half in different parts of the room. And I hope. I hope those symbols influence those tiny miracles from God in some, some small way. Whether it did them or not, it certainly has on me because I can't look at a scene based on the story of Noah and the ark without remembering those, those sweet babies. Also this week, I was reminded of things that once upon a time happened in many churches. See, I subscribe to a couple of online journals. They used to come in person, but, but they're online journals there. And in the back of those journals, they're, they're Presbyterian ones, is the, the name of people who are getting calls to, to different churches and, and, the, and the names of people who, who might have gotten a doctorate degree or, or are honorably retiring. And of course, there's also obituaries, notices of death. And I came across a couple. They died within about a week of each other after being married many, many years, who had been missionaries, missionaries for the Presbyterian Church. And I frankly thought they had probably died years ago. They were old when I was a kid, or at least I thought they were. But I remember them because they would come back to the state for a sabbatical each year, and they would go to different churches to share what it was they were doing and, and to sort of sing for them supper. You, you, you knew how that worked. The missionaries would arrive. They, they would say something in church, and then you'd have a covered dish dinner afterwards, and they'd tell you about their missionary work. And since I was the oldest of the preacher's kid and the most responsible, I had an important job. I got to click next on the side proje slide projector. Oh, I thought I was important clicking those things that, that went around and looking at all those places from all over the world. What I remember is their stories, and their stories are very similar to other missionaries' stories. You see, when Christian missionaries went to what, what we called at that time the, the third world, they discovered, they discovered that different tribes had different gods. Some tribes, some tribes believed their gods loved the people who were rich and punished the people who were poor. Or that they loved the healthy people and not the sick people. And it was not uncommon for them to believe that their God loves only the people of their tribe exclusively and certainly didn't love those people in other tribes. And theology and, and history books tell us that this is not unusual. Various groups, both tribal and religious, throughout human history, have insisted that they were exclusively God's people. Now, now we try to say we're beyond that. We, we abhor such thinking today when we see it in others. However, such a discriminating and exclusive view of God can be found among Christians who may be inclined to think or act as if they are the only people who matter to God, or at least rank higher than everybody else in God's social hierarchy. The, 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 the statement is something like this, I know Jesus loves everybody, but we're his favorite. However, the story of Noah, which is part of today's lectionary reading from Genesis, well, it challenges, even back in Genesis, 
such a narrow view of God. Now the reading, the reading is the end of a story that is familiar to most all of us. Even non-Jews and Christians, they know the story of Noah and the ark. Noah gets a call to build a big boat. And his neighbors think he is crazy. It hasn't rained like that in a long time. And then Noah, he, he goes out and finds two of every animal to get on the boat with him. And people are laughing even crazier. I mean, it's pretty specific in the, the, the Bible about what kind of wood was used and, and the number of cubits it took. And this story, because of that, has prompted much discussion and disagreement about how literally the details should be taken. I mean, did Noah really go down to Australia and find platypuses or platypi? I don't know how you say that, but two of them. The building of the ark and the image of the animals, it's important. And it's interesting to think about. But what's more important than the ark or the animals or even the flood itself, well, if I understand the text, it's the message of the rainbow. It's that rainbow which I remember being on artwork in my girl's room and what that rainbow represents that I want to have as our focus today. Because that image is offered by God not as a promise to one group of people. But if you heard in the text and, and you really listened, it says to all living things. God is saying that God does not distinguish between groups. That God is a God who loves all groups equally. That, 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 that would include Palestinians and Israelis. That would include Caucasians and African Americans and Asians and Hispanics and all hues in between. It would include those who are straight and gay and bisexual and transgender, those who go by he or she or they. It would include the rich people and the poor people and those of us who are working paycheck to paycheck. It would include young people and old people, tall, short, thin, not so thin, and everything in between. This story is an invitation to reflect on what it means to be in covenant with a God, a God who loves all. Because being in covenant includes being in a relationship. And relationships, be they with a friend or a family member or with God, are life-giving only when we accept what they provide. So how does one relate to a God who loves each of us so profoundly and at the same time does not discriminate in the ways that we humans do? Because let's be honest, our society and culture encourages us to discriminate between the, the in crowd, which we're a part of, and everybody else. And our society and its culture does not encourage us to focus on our relationship with God. Now that's not to say as a people we are antagonistic to God. What it does say is that this world, this world pulls our attention in so many different directions. Some of us are, are busy, busy with the, the, the raising of kids and families, of figuring out what's for dinner that night. That question ever come up in your household? 
Some of us have jobs or jobs we're seeking or jobs we have been voluntold to do by somebody. Some of us, if we're not raising, raising children, I know several of us in here are, raise, are raising chickens, or, 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 or we got pets that are, that are raising us. There are various groups that pull our attention. PTA, Scouts, there's a retired educators club that some of us are, are pretty involved in. There are civic clubs, there are book clubs, there's a craft club I know about where they do a little bit of crafting and a lot of talking is my understanding, but, but I won't get into that. I'd be going from preaching to meddling. We got people who have, have volleyball and cheerleading and soccer. And oh, by the way, doctor's appointment. Try to schedule a doctor appointment and not take it, make it last the whole day. And on top of that, some of us have a mountain of laundry that needs folding. In our house, we can get the laundry washed in, in 24 hours, but folding and putting away, that's 7 to 10 business days. At times, we feel like that gerbil on the, the family treadmill, you know, in, inside its cage. We're just running and running and running, and we're not going anywhere. Certainly not focusing on God. Dr. Scott Peck, the author of the best-selling The Road Less Travel, was once asked in an interview how often he prayed. He said that he set time aside to pray every day. His questioner asked him how he could afford to take the time to pray when he had to write books and lectures to prepare and present and a travel schedule as well as his own personal psychiatry practice to maintain. Peck responded by saying that with all of these things to do, he could not afford not to take the time. For him, it was a necessary time. It was a way of reaching back out to a God who had already reached out to him. You know what a wedding? In a wedding, it's customary for two people entering the marriage to exchange rings as a sign of their commitment to one another. But even this simple gesture requires a, a response. It's not enough that one partner simply places the ring on the finger of the other. The partner receiving that ring has to extend their finger to receive it. You can't put a ring on a closed hand. And then after receiving that ring, it doesn't end there. Unless there is an ongoing reaching out to one another, the wedding does not really become a marriage. Friends, God is forever encircling our, us, but we need to extend ourselves in an ongoing way to experience the covenant that is offered by God. Of course, what's true for a marriage is true for any connection that rises to the level of a relationship. It, it needs to be a two-way street, a mutual reaching out that goes beyond obligation. In fact, when obligation becomes the primary basis of a relationship, there's not much relationship left there at all. I mean, if you just send a happy birthday card or the Mother's Day card to someone that we ignore the rest of the year, there's not a whole lot behind it. The card really gets its meaning from the interaction in between those special days. Friends, even God being here today in relationship with us gains its meaning by all that we do in between the Sundays. So how do we hold ourselves out to God? 
How do we maintain or heighten our awareness of a God who not only loves us deeply, but who offers us that same covenant, that same love to people the world may judge as unworthy of anybody's love, let alone God's? That question is not all that different from the one the disciples of Jesus asked him one day when they asked him how, how to pray. In reality, they were asking that Jesus show them how to maintain and grow their relationship with God. You recall in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus told the hearers that when they prayed, they should do so in private. He exemplified this by going off by himself often when he prayed. The the point was not to hide. The point was then and now to allow ourselves the space and the quiet to bring God into awareness in our hectic world. The point is to grow into an ongoing awareness of a God who continues to create us and whose love for us and commitment to us is what sustains us. Ours is a God who is the rainbow in the stormy skies of our life, but we have to look up to see it. I've discovered in my own prayer life that one of the things that most distracts me is a little thing. It doesn't look that big, but it makes more noise than I know what to do with. My my watch even does the same thing. I get texts. Sometimes I get them during the sermon. Sometimes they say, hurry up. But but, but I've learned to to put those things aside at least one time a day to pray. For some of us, a way to this awareness is to sit quietly and reflect on the ba- on the blessings of our lives. But beyond that, it means that we remain aware that regardless of our differences as human beings, God loves us all. Jesus did not teach us to pray saying, my Father. He said, our Father. When we were little, we were taught to say our prayers. As we listen to the stories of scriptures, it becomes apparent that real prayer requires as much listening as it does speaking. While the ear of God is always open to our call, the voice of God is forever speaking. We just have to take the time to listen. A young boy named Billy understood this as well as any theologian or spiritual guru, he was complaining to another assistant principal at another school about the girl who sat next to him in class. They had had some sort of an argument, and and Billy was talking with him about it, and he said that the little girl sitting next to him, she, she bothered him. He said, well, how does she... Father, you, Billy, she talks all the time. She talks way, way, way too much. The principal said, well, 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 why does that bother you so much, Billy? He said, I need time that's quiet so I can listen to God in my heart. He had heard that somewhere, and there's some real truth in that. We need to take the time to listen for God speaking to our hearts. It's not so often the girl sitting next to us who doesn't get quiet that disturbs us, and that never happens in my house, by the way, or the next-door neighbor who blocks out the voice of God as it is all the other things that we give our priority to. 
You know, when asked, when asked what your priority is, you can say lots of things. But I often can tell from people's time and what they do with their resources where it really is. Friends, even a rainbow in the sky offers beauty only to those who take the time to stop and look up. The many colors of the message of God can only be heard by those who stop long enough to listen. Returning to the marriage analogy, most of us know that taking the other for granted is a quick way to hurt a relationship. The same is true with our friendships, but it's also true with our relationship with God. God taken for granted becomes God far removed from the center of our lives. Covenants that are removed from the center not only become peripheral, they become meaningless. So keeping God in the center by whatever means we find works for us is as important as keeping any significant relationship central to our lives. Children, children as well as those adults, who have managed to preserve some of their childlike qualities, are thrilled by the sight of a rainbow. Every once in a while, we'll have one in the playground at school, and they get excited. Look, look, there's a rainbow. There's a rainbow. Mr. Gunner, do you see it? There, there's a rainbow. Perhaps we need to learn to see rainbows in our lives with the eyes of children, to let the rainbows of our lives be what God told us today they are meant to be, a sign of God's covenant with all creatures, including you and me, including some of those folks that we don't care for a whole lot because God loves all. This story and its theme from Noah is not just the way, it's not just important as a, a, a wall border theme that goes in a nursery, but it's the theme of love and grace and hope that invites us to take the time to use whatever means works best for us to keep God and God's love at the center of our lives. It invites us to become more aware of how that plays out by listening to what God has to say to us. And certainly as we go into this Lenten season that began this week, it's an important and appropriate time to take such practices seriously. Friends, if we are to become instruments of peace, we need to take the time to let peace into our own lives so that we can see the rainbows that are all around us. Friends, we live in a world that desperately needs to hear about love and forgiveness and grace. The love and forgiveness and grace that we remember every time we come to this table. Friends, we need to be reminded and remind the world that God's love, that God's promise is to all creation. Or if I had been writing the text from Noah, I would say, God loves all you. Yes, y'all means all. And that indeed is not just the theme of this text, Story, but it's the story of the entire Bible. From Genesis to Revelation, we find the good news of a God who loves, who loves us recklessly, even when we don't deserve it. Friends, in this story of Noah and the ark, God makes a promise to all who live on the earth, regardless of who we are. God makes the covenant with all living things. Such a promise shows us the God who sees beyond tribes and nations and skin colors and even religions. God's rainbow is offered to all, 
And while this is an awesome truth, it's one that requires a response from you and me. Oh, may we respond by seeking rainbows, pointing them out to others. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, hallelujah, amen. Let us pray. Good and gracious God, we believe, help our unbelief in Christ. Amen. Friends, having heard the good news and the good news proclaimed, please stand in body or spirit and repeat with me the Apostles' Creed found on the inside cover of your hymnal. Friends, what do you believe? I believe in God the Father Almighty maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He descended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. You may be seated. God calls us to live to lives of grateful generosity. Let us praise the giver of all good gifts through our offerings today. Why should I feel discouraged? Why should the shadows come? Why should my heart be lonely and long for heaven and home when Jesus is my portion, my constant friend is he. His eye is on the sparrow, and I know he watches me. His eye is on the sparrow, and I know he watches me. And I sing because I'm happy. I sing because I am free. His eye is on the sparrow. And I know he watches me.
prayer of dedication found in your bulletin. Let us pray. God of grace, you provide for us in amazing ways. Accept these offerings as signs of our gratitude and bless them to further Christ's ministry and mission among the poor, the suffering, and the destitute. Amen. You may be seated. We come now on this first Sunday of Lent to the sacrament of the Lord's table. It is a reminder of us of the covenant of God, the covenant of love and grace, a covenant that invites us all into communion with Him. Friends, this is not a Presbyterian table. It's the table of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, and all, all are welcome. Let us pray. Good and gracious God, as we come to the table, may we be reminded of your love, your love that was from the beginning of creation, the love that has been through generations, the love that you have shown through rainbows and empty tombs. Oh God, take these very simple elements, bless them, use them to strengthen our bodies and our spirits that we might serve you in this world, in all we say and in all we do. For it's in your sons, Jesus, Jesus, who is the Christ's name we pray. Amen. Friends, on the night our Lord and Savior was betrayed, he took bread, and after giving thanks, he broke it. And he said, this, this is my body broken for you. Eat, do this in remembrance of me. In a likewise manner, he took the cup, and again, after giving thanks, he said, this cup is my blood poured out for your sins. Drink, do this in remembrance of me. Friends, these are the gifts of God for the people of God. You're invited to come to the table.
Let us pray. God of the wilderness, we began our Lenten journey eager to draw closer to you. In a world full of temptation, in a world full of noise and grief and loss, we long to feel you in our midst. So this morning we come to you with open hearts, and with all the honesty we can muster, we give you our prayers. We start this morning, God, by expressing our gratitude for the blessings we can see. Thank you for bread. Thank you for community. Thank you for music that makes our hearts swell and for people who know our name. Thank you for the gift of resilience and for every act of love that spurs hope in us. We know that you walk with us in the mountains and the valleys. We know that you walk with us in the wilderness, and for that we give thanks. And yet with equal honesty, God, we ask for your strength. This world requires resilience of us. The world demands that, like Jesus in the wilderness, we learn how to say no to evil, how to guard our hearts like treasure in clay jars. So for ourselves, we ask for prayers of wisdom and patience, guidance and comfort. We ask that you would bind up the aching parts of our hearts and speak truth into the anxious parts of our brain. But our prayers do not stop with us, God. Our prayers do not end inside this room. Instead, we throw our prayers out into the world and ask that you would care for our neighbors just as you care for us. So today we pray for them. Comfort the afflicted, God. Guide those in seasons of discernment. Draw near to those who feel alone. Protect the grieving. Be with the traumatized in Israel and Palestine. Be with those longing for peace in the battlefields of Ukraine. And be with the citizens of this world who face violence and hunger and yet their stories go untold. In a world full of temptation, in a world full of noise, in a world that requires resilience, we know you walk with us. We know that even now you are here. So we draw closer to you today by praying together the words your son taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Our closing hymn is number 379, My Hope is Built on Nothing Less. Let's sing the first and last stanzas together. Jesus, Lord. 
beloved people of God, I invite you in the name of Christ to observe a holy Lent by self-examination and penance, by prayer and fasting, by works of love, and by meditating on God's Word. So now, as you go out into the world, go out in peace. Have courage. Hold fast to what is good. Return no one evil for evil, but strengthen the faint-hearted. Support the weak. Help the suffering. Honor all people. Love and serve the Lord your God, rejoicing in the power of the Holy Spirit. And may the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make His face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you and give you peace both this day and forevermore. Friends, go knowing that you are loved. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, hallelujah, amen. Go in peace. Mm -hmm.